I would like to introduce Garth Illingworth. He is uh, a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And among his many honors are, uh, he was a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. In 2010, he was an, awarded an honorary doctorate of science at the West, University of Western Australia. He was the recipient of the 2016 American Astronomical Society Lancelot and Berkeley New York Community Trust Prize. <laughs> and in 2018, he was the Bacall Lecturer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And finally, I hope you have all seen some of the absolutely stunning images from the newly uh, functional uh, James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm particularly pleased that we have Garth Illingworth here because he is essentially one of the fathers of this telescope. And today he's going to tell us about its history and what it's doing now. So thank you, Garth. Good. Thank you very much, Ellie. I'm <laughs> Delighted to be here, and thank you all very much for coming. And uh, your timing on web couldn't be better. Uh, last week, of course, was we were in my wife and I, Wendy, were in Baltimore at the unveiling of the in image of the space telescope. It was incredible to see those come in. I knew how powerful this was going to web was going to be, but actually seeing it really made a difference. So I will talk about web or JWST or James Webb or whatever, you know, they're all interchangeable. So they get mixed up in my slides here. And I had to come, of course, with this. And I have my web socks as well. <laughs> so let's go on with, uh, ah, sorry, I wanted to start a timer here so that I, because I get carried away. It's very easy with this. So a week ago, a week and a half ago, the first images from Webb were released by NASA, and uh, it was an amazing event to see it. So I often think of Webb as our Hubble on steroids. This is an amazingly powerful telescope. Hubble has been incredible, but this is sort of in the next dimension beyond in capability. So that image that you're looking at there was actually shown at the White House, and the president introduced it on the Monday night just this one image, but they had a series of these images. And I will show you these later, and uh, I will go through them and tell you something about them, but I'll also tell you about the very first science results that have come out, even within one week. So folks are jumping on this incredibly quickly. So there are the dates, launch Christmas Day last year, ERO release in uh, last week. And so I'm going to talk a little about how we get to having such a remarkable telescope, the lead up to launch, and what happened during commissioning. And then I'm gonna back right back 35 years to when we actually started this whole activity. And then I'll come into the first images and science results to give you a, a flavor of what Webb can really do. I'm sure you folks have seen images like this. This was, these two images are from Northrop Grumman in Redondo Beach where the telescope was finally all assembled. And this is showing the full uh, sun shield opened out for the last time as part of the testing process. And then the telescope was folded up and this is what it looked like when it went into the rocket shroud. And you'll see some other images of that coming up. So of course we had to get it from Redondo Beach to the launch site which was actually being launched on a French rocket in French Guiana and uh, at the Kourou launch site. And so it shipped out from LA through the Grand, uh, Panama Canal over to Kourou. And uh, obviously we were a little nervous about this, $10 billion worth of observatory on a ship going through the Pan Pan Panama Canal. It was kept very quiet because folks didn't want, you know, everybody was a little nervous about whether there'd be anything happen to it on the way. But when it finally got to Kourou, there was a lot of uh, happiness that it was okay, everything went well, and that it could all be announced. So, ah, next one. So once at Kourou, it was there three months, checking it out, making sure that everything was still working. And then about a few couple of weeks before Christmas, it was fueled, the upper left uh, image there. The guys in weird looking suits are handling very uh, 
volatile and somewhat dangerous propellants and putting it into the webs for its rocket thrusters and then Webb is being picked up, ready to put on top of the rocket. Every time I see it picked up, I think, I hope they rated that cable correctly. <laughs> but we've never had a problem, so it's okay. So then here is the fairing being put over Webb on the left in the vehicle assembly building, and then Webb itself and the rocket, the Ariane 5, the French rocket, being taken out to the launch pad. Uh, I think it was two days before Christmas, and so it was there over until Christmas morning. And then we had an absolutely flawless Ariane launch. Christmas morning, 7.20 a.m. on the dot, Eastern Time. And uh, Wendy and I were at Space Telescope for that as well, and we're sitting there listening to the audio coming through from the flight control center in Kourou. And what was wonderful was the flight manager there kept saying nominal, nominal. That for people in the space business, that's what flight managers do. When they say it's nominal, you go, yay, verily, this is what we want. And so all the way through the mission, at all the different stages, he was going nominal, and everybody sort of sighs of relief in the room. So we got to the point then, and this is an interesting one. So there's an upper stage that takes Webb out. And that upper stage, the fairing comes off, and that upper stage carries it out some distance. And while it's there, this upper stage is rotating back and forward because the sun is on web, and we don't want it to get too hot in any area. So it's like a chicken on a spit. We're actually rotating it back and forward. And then when it gets to the right place, web was ejected by a series of springs underneath. So this is the back end of web. And what's really nice about this is Ariane never had a camera on their uh, rockets before. And they put one specially on this one earlier than they ex planned to do, just so we could see what Webb was doing. And so let me show you uh, a little video here, which I think will start, yes. So this is a video actually of that ejection from the rocket and Webb moving away. Now, the very first thing that had to happen with Webb was for the solar panels to come out. Webb has batteries on board, but they only last seven or eight hours. So if the solar panel did not come out in that time, Webb was space junk. So that was a very nervous point for us, and we expected that to happen at six minutes. And so here is Webb drifting away, and we were thinking, well, we'll probably never get to see the panels come out because it's going to be too far away. And of course, the upper stage of the rocket is being driven away from Webb. We don't want the upper stage tracking Webb out towards L2. So it's being driven away. So we're all looking at this, watching it and watching it and watching it, thinking, oh, it's going to start disappearing soon, soon. Kept watching and thinking, oh, this is a magnificent. It looks like it's just moving away beautifully. Everything's going to be great, but we'll miss seeing those panels. And then, any moment now. <laughs> the panels actually start to come out just around now. And the commentator, there they go. The commentator at Kourou said, huh, they weren't meant to come out yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and most of them, those of us in the room who sort of roughly knew the schedule were thinking, what's going on? Anyway, we weren't going to complain. We wanted the panels out and this looked great. It turned out afterwards, I asked the system engineer, I said, what happened? He said, beats me. <laughs> so, <laughs> what actually happened was that the Ariane launch was so absolutely flawless in positioning web with the right velocity and direction that the onboard thrusters didn't have to do anything. Mm. Nothing at all. So the automatic, the autonomous software went, oh, we're in great shape. Let's just eject the solar array. Mm. And so that's what happened. So we were glad that we got to see it and we were glad that the solar array came out. So at this point then, we started on a long process of making sure that all the parts of web would deploy, the mirrors, the sun shield, like the solar panel did. There are a whole lot of things that had to deploy on web. 
And so this, I just gave you, there's a lot of detail here, but the main thing is to note that we have a period where we're doing all those deployments, two weeks roughly, where everything had to come out so that we had a full web looking telescope with everything in place. That was critical. If anything had failed in there, it would have been worthless. It would not have worked for us. So that was a two week period, two week period to lift the mirrors, those 18 segments off their stops and position them correctly. And then at that point, we also are gonna be getting into this Lagrange point orbit a million miles from the earth beyond the moon. And then we started actually telescope commissioning. And then we go into the science instruments, the cameras and spectrographs that really record the data. So, there is a lot to do in here. As I noticed, there were 730 high-level defined activities that were done there, 10,000 steps to go through. So folks say, why did it take so long? And I, it was basically, there is so much to do there to get this telescope working properly. So I'll show you a little bit of this on the way. So, and I think you've probably seen a lot of this already from some of the images earlier this year. But as it leaves Earth, it's in this folded up configuration. The first thing is that these pallets, the unitized structure pallets come out that hold the sun shield. And then the sun shield starts to be pulled out. And this is, in, I'll show you something later about this. this, is an amazingly complex process. So the sun shield is tensed, pulled out, and then the layers have to be separated with exactly the right tension to get the right shape so that the telescope, the cooling works properly. Then secondary mirror comes out, and then the wings fold out, and then we're fully unfolded after two weeks. And everything worked. There's a whole lot of other steps, of course, that are not in this simple depiction. These are the major activities. Lots of flaps and other things that also were brought out. But in two weeks, everything worked, which was an incredible relief to everybody. We all thought it would work, but we we're also a little nervous, I have to say. And so there was a lot of cheering all round when they fully unfolded. So this all happened, of course, while Webb is on a journey out to this Lagrange point, a million miles from Earth beyond the moon. And so when Webb was launched, it was uh, put into this trajectory to get it out to this Lagrange point. But it wasn't put in there with exactly the right velocity to get there. And the reason, and then we had to do some onboard burns with the rocket thrusters to get it to L2. And it had to be done very carefully because if we overshot, there was absolutely no way to slow Webb down and it just would have kept going. So we had to do these two of these burns to get us there. As it turned out, Ariane had put us, positioned us in terms of the speed, the velocity, almost exactly right. A little under, which is what it, it needed to do. So little, in fact, that the burns didn't use much fuel. And so instead of getting 10 years of life out of the propellants with Webb, we have over 20 years of life. So propellant will not be a problem. So this is good. So Webb was sent out, a last burn here, that put it into this halo orbit around this point beyond the moon. And I'll show you a little video in a moment that then this goes around the Earth and with the, around the sun with the Earth and the moon. And it's just a beautiful place to have an observatory. It's cold, it's dark, it's well away from everything. So let me start up this little video. So here you can see Earth with a little moon going around, the little white one, and the Webb telescope on this halo orbit around this L2 point. And this big orbit is really important because it keeps Webb from ever being shielded from the sun or uh, by the Earth. Because we always want it to see the sun and it always needs to see the sun to get power. So that's basically it tracks around with us around the sun all year. So here we are, we're in L2. We've done 50 major deployments, 280 single point failures. If any one of the release mechanisms had failed, we would have been in real deep trouble. And so, and if we could not have tweaked the observatory or shaken it to make it work, that would have meant that it was basically unusable. 
So, and all then included all these actuators, the release things, everything worked beautifully. There were a couple of moments where people were a little nervous about what was going on, but they found some other ways to monitor and tell what the, the configuration of the satellite or the telescope was so they could do the next step. So everywhere it came about and worked very well. So I just want to take a little diversion and now give you a little sense of what Webb is like from collecting the light and its orientation with respect to the sun. So it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful and very capable telescope, basically a telescope. Light comes in, hits the primary mirror, goes up to the secondary, down through the middle, there's a steering mirror there and a couple of additional optics, but basically, and then into a package of instruments that are cameras and spectrographs. So they have detect infrared detectors, there's an infrared observatory, everything here works in the infrared. So not the same sort of sensors that you have in your phones and so on, but it's similar in concept, but infrared. And so that package up there contains everything, all the images, all the science will come out of those instruments. Now, this is the challenging part. In the infrared, you absolutely have to have a cold telescope and cold instruments. We can do this on the ground, but we can't get a cold telescope. We can make instruments cold. But the background in space is between a million and 10 million times darker. So if working, trying to use a telescope here in the infrared, the far infrared during nighttime is like trying to observe in the daytime in optical. The sky is incredibly bright and you just can't do very much. People do and we can do science, but you're very limited. By pushing Webb out at this distance and keeping it cold, we actually now are looking as though it were nighttime on the ground in the optical and the background is over a million times lower. This makes a huge difference. But of course we have to get webbed down to incredibly cold temperatures. So here we are minus 400 odd degrees Fahrenheit, close to absolute zero. And the sun shield is what does that. So you, we have the two sides of web, the hot side and the cold side. The hot side has the uh, com computational communications, the spacecraft which contains all the sort of hardware for communicating and computing etc. And then above this sun shield sits the telescope with the instruments at the back. And the universe cools this down. We only have one active cooler in there and that's for one of the instruments that has to get six degrees above absolute zero. So we have one cooler that works. It's, a, not a, it's an electrical cooler, very effective, and it's working beautifully. But all the rest of it is cooled because the universe is basically three degrees, 10 degrees Kelvin. It's like a giant refrigerator out there. And it has cooled down dramatically, as you'll see. So, of course, as we look at this, you wonder how Webb actually gets to see things in the sky. And so at any one point, it can look away from the sun in the, some direction, but we have set it up. There's no way to move the telescope separately from the other structure. So this is a body that has to move and the whole thing points. So obviously we never want to have anything on the telescope see the sun. So we have to limit how much the sun shield actually changes. But we can rotate the sun shield right around this way and the telescope can sweep out a swath on the sky and then you can also move it back and forward like this so you get a band on the sky that we can sweep out at any time. And then of course the telescope is moving around the sun and that band moves around. So we can see the whole sky over the year with uh, this telescope with the motions here that we have. But it's very different to the telescopes you'll look at, you'll look at here where they move and can point in any direction at any time. Well, except down. So, so now coming back to the commissioning period. So uh, within a couple of weeks after we got into L2, one of the cameras was brought up and the instruments, uh, that instrument was turned on. And then the first images were taken. Now, of course, we have 18 segments here which have been set up on the ground to be where we think they should be, but obviously they're not going to be aligned by the time we have launched this and sent it into orbit. So the first step was to actually 
find a nice bright star and see what each of these segments was doing, whether it was pointed way over here or whether they, you know, they were sort of in a useful place where we could see them. As it turned out, the ground calibration of the pointing was remarkably good. So each one of these stars here is from each one of the segments of banging off the second mirror and secondary mirror and coming back. But they were in a remarkably small area. Folks fed, took this telescope and scanned a huge area and found out most of these were in near the center. So that was set up extremely well. So once the images were found like this, then a lot of work was done over the next months to try and bring them together, to tune them up. And the big event came a month later when this image was shown where all 18 segments are now actually working as one mirror together. Uh, tilted and oriented, tied together beautifully. And in fact, you can see that here. This is what's called a, a pupil image. And it takes a special lens, but it's basically the camera looks at the mirror and images that. And the uniformity of the light here indicates that it's incredibly well aligned, as does the very compact size of that image. So a month and a half after getting into L2, we were, optically we're in a remarkably good shape. There was more work to be done to make sure it tuned up best for all the instruments. But at this point, we knew we had a telescope with extremely precise optics. It was going to do a great job. So I'm not going to go through detail because I want to make sure I have time to talk about what we actually saw at the end last week and what we're doing. So there was a lot of fine tuning of the optics that continued for, let me see, probably a month and a half. And then the instruments were all being set up and characterized and tests were being done with them to make sure they were all working. And that took about another month and a half or so and took us through June into early July, at which point the telescope could actually, was actually started to be used to start to get uh, some of the early science images and the early release images. So we can actually, any of us can go online and monitor how Webb is doing, where it is in its orbit, et cetera, and how hot and cold it is. So on the left-hand side, the warm side, the sun shield is 113 degrees Fahrenheit. It can get up to 200 in a warm orientation. And uh, the spacecraft is around 54 degrees, sort of nice balmy temperatures there. The cold side is a tad cooler, like 400 degrees cooler. So that, it, that is truly amazing, actually, when you think about how much colder that actually is. And the, you, know, you have a sun shield that's not sort of much more than this with these five layers, and that makes a huge difference to the amount of heat. So I'll come back to all these EROs later, but these were then what was taken in basically through July, so that folks could prepare the images and make a wonderful set of images to demonstrate that Webb was working really well, as NASA really likes to do. It likes to do a big media event and show everybody. I mean. We spent $10 billion of the, our money, European money, and Canadian money. So NASA and the scientists really appreciate this and really want to show folks who paid for this that we have a wonderful facility and we're going to be doing great science and getting a lot of great information out as often as we can. So I'm, I want to back up now and walk through um, how we actually got to this point, because these projects are tough. They take a long time, and uh, they're technically challenging, they're politically challenging, and so I'll spend a little time walking through this. So in 1985, this is what we were starting to talk about. The next generation space telescope looks a little different to what we actually flew now, but this was before Hubble launched, remember? This is like five years before Hubble launched. And so it actually started one day when I came in and uh, I was told, start working on the next big mission. It will take a very long time. <laughs> now, at that point, I was working in Baltimore Space Telescope Science Institute and was the deputy director. The director was uh, Riccardo Giacconi. He subsequently got the Nobel Prize for his work on X-ray telescopes. And so one morning he just said, you know, 
you guys need to work on this. <laughs> and we went, oh no, it's like five, four years before Hubble launches and we're up to our you know, eyebrows in work, there's so much to do. And he said, trust me, you've got to start early. So being the boss, we went, yes sir. <laughs> and so a few of us got together and started talking about the concept. And we really thought that having a cold infrared, very large telescope way out in space would be a really powerful tool that would complement and build on Hubble. We knew Hubble was going to be great, but you know, we just thought we have to find something that was Hubble cannot do and what will really likely be great to do scientifically. So this is what we started to work on at that point and uh, to involve people. So here is uh, an image from Outside Space Telescope Science Institute. I, I'm not quite sure, it was 85 or 86 or something, 86 I think. And there's the director there, Riccardo Giacconi, and then me when I had color in my hair. I was a little younger those days. And uh, Peter Stockman and, and Pierre Belli. I mean, we were sort of the core team there, but so many people were fascinated by this that um, it uh, got very, you know, a lot of interest in that group. So here is what we were thinking about, conceptualizing what comes beyond Hubble before Hubble. So that was an interesting challenge, actually. And so here's just a little more about the first meeting that we held in Baltimore at Space Telescope Science Institute. I'd actually just moved the year before to Santa Cruz. And so I was still working this with folks there and we went back and did the meeting. And so, uh, at this point, there were, that meeting was uh, held with 120 people, scientists, engineers from academia with support from NASA. That sort of started the discussion about it. There was an opportunity then to actually build on that through another process. Every 10 years, the astronomy community decides that uh, works up a plan for the future to recommend to NASA, NSF, Department of Energy, the key agencies, and Congress is always very interested in this, what we should collectively be doing in the next 10 years, the missions, the projects. So we had a panel there which was set up to look at space telescopes and space facilities. And the panel recommended doing a six meter actually, and even gave a cost for it with $2 billion in those days, which was a lot of money, but Hubble, you know, it's sort of comparable to what Hubble costs. And so this got into that discussion. It didn't get recommended by the final committee because there are other things the final committee th thought that astronomy wanted to do, but at least it got it some visibility and thinking about in the community. We also were working with JPL with, re with support from NASA headquarters to look at all the technologies as well. And so a workshop was held in 1991 particularly focused on this large infrared space telescope, cooled down to 100 degrees above absolute zero. We weren't quite as ambitious in those days, but eight meters, we were pretty ambitious on the size. We even talked about a 16 meter on the moon because NASA said, we want to go back to the moon in the early 90s. Sound familiar? Anyway, so, and you need to tell us about what you would do there. So we thought, okay, fine, we'll do that. So we talked about a 16 meter, but in our hearts, we felt that the one that was really gonna happen was the one free flying and maybe eight meters or so. So work was being done on that as well around in the early 90s. So of course Hubble launched and Hubble when it launched was in bad shape. It had that optical problem and the images were terrible. So that distracted a lot of people and NASA trying to work out how to fix Hubble and the budget funding for work on NGST slowed right down at that point. Well of course we got, the astronauts took up a wonderful instrument to, or a couple of instruments to Hubble and fixed it as it were, corrected its optical problems. And this deep field was done in 1995. And this was mind blowing for astronomers. People, folks just didn't expect, astronomers did not expect to have a richness of galaxies like this that you would see with a telescope like Hubble. And so this was 10 days of time that it took to do this. I recently did the calculation, Webb can do this in six or seven hours. 
It is amazingly more powerful. But this actually was incredibly important because it set the stage for revitalizing thinking about web or NGST at that time. Very important report came out in about 1995 but they recommended a four meter infrared telescope with somewhat limited wavelength range. So I wasn't particularly happy about this because we knew bigger was better in this case, really better. But at the American Astronomical Society meeting in 1995, the NASA administrator got up on the stage and says, I see Alan Dressler here. He was the uh, author of this, the chair of this report. He want, all he wants is a four meter optic that goes from half a micron to 20 microns, which was actually not what they said in the report. And I said to him, why do you ask for such a modest thing? Why not go after six to seven meters? Well, yes, exactly. And so since the NASA administrator was saying this, NASA suddenly thought, okay, good, we'll get to work on this. So that basically led to activity at Goddard Space Flight Center, where they started thinking about and working on NGST and concepts for NGST. Dan Golden had actually decided then within a few weeks or months that eight meters was better to start with and uh, which made me even more happy. So a lot of eight meter studies and as I said here at the bottom, I mean I was delighted with this change. I s felt very strongly that four meters was too small having had Hubble going into the infrared where you need a bigger telescope and it was crucial to make a huge, a big step beyond. So what Dan Golden here did for us was incredibly important. Webb would not have been anything as good as we are seeing today if he had not done that. So then during the latter part of the 90s, a lot of work was going on about uh, studies on the telescope systems, etc. here and uh, coming up with concepts, deployable concepts, and other ways of getting out to doing work at, uh, in space. So getting NGST started really and turning it into a mission though, required the decadal survey, coming back again 10 years later to be supportive, and they did. They said it was their number one priority. Now, the cost was also being mentioned as $1 billion. This turns out to be a major problem, as you'll see. So, at two th around 2001, NGST really became a reality. And so, it started to move forward as a big project. So, how did we get here? Well, unfortunately, it was slow, it was painful, and it was very expensive in the end. But as I look over this program and I look at the people involved, tens of, probably between 10 and 20,000 people across the nation, Europe, Canada, have worked on this in various ways. It's been a huge project with a lot of incredibly capable and dedicated people. But it was rough at first. So the budget was too tight. Uh, Northrop Grumman was selected as the prime contract, it was actually TRW, but they were bought out. Uh, it was renamed the James Webb Space Telescope, much earlier than normal. So that was sort of a frustration for a lot of the astronomers. So serious work began on this in 2003. But the first 10 years were just rough, hard. And the reason was, was because the budget was too low. It started out too low. As the NASA administrator, now Mike Griffin, said in the mid-90s was it was under-costed, that they, it wasn't realistic. And every year, budgets are done yearly, as you know, with Congress and with the agencies. Every year there were problems going on with the budget. The budget had to be increased every year, and Congress and the Office of Management and Budget did not like this. <laughs> so it was formally set to go into construction by NASA in 2008. But the budget problem still persisted. At that point, we were talking about 2014 launch and $4 billion. But there was serious budget issues in 2010. And so, and you know, for policy makers were really worried about this. Senator Mikulski, a senator from Maryland who was very supportive of Webb, realized that her colleagues were getting frustrated with this and said that we have to find out what's going on here. 
you guys, we're hearing you're not going to launch, you need more, in 2014 you need more money. She asked the NASA administrator to set up a small group of people to look at this and tell him and her and Congress what had to be done to make this work. And so here was the committee. I was the only astronomer on this committee, an incredible group of project managers. It was an incredible experience working with these folks. But we were looking back and he said the budget was too low. There weren't enough reserves every year to fix problems. And so technologies were still being developed too early. And so we estimated that it would take a couple of more years to launch and would take one and a half billion dollars. But that was a thing we did on a blackboard. With some experience, very, not me, but the project managers were very experienced at this. They just said this is, is definitely going to need more money and time. But said NASA has to do a proper request here. Congress and OMB did not like to see even our number. So then what happened? So NASA said, yeah, we're going to do, take this seriously. We accept your report. It was hard hitting and pretty critical. They said, fine. We'll go off and work this and see what it's going to take to make this mission happen. Well, a very careful analysis was done in the next six months and it was going to take $8 billion and not launch till 2018 and require budgets. You see here, this is five, $600 million a year for many years. So as I say here, OMB and Congress were even unhappier. <laughs> so that caused a lot of heartburn and it caused a cancellation. The chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee dealing with NASA said basically, ah, I'm done with this, with terminating funding. So this was in the House Appropriations Committee. In July 7th, I still remember the day, I saw an email go by, oh no, this is not good. So it was a huge effort undertaken to recover Webb. So support from Nobel laureates, a lot of physicists and so on. A lot of public support. This was really fascinating. We were amazed that Webb had already captured the imagination of a lot of folks. And I, one thing I really remember was I got an email from a teacher in Kansas who said, how can we help, that being them and their students? And we, I just thought, this is unbelievable. You know, we're years away from launch and we have that level of interest around the country from planetaria, folks like you who know about astronomy. This was incredible and really made a difference with um, Congress in that they were getting messages and letters and so Chairman Wolf just was getting the sense that, well, this is probably pretty important to do. Senator Mikulski was working on it, and together they came up with a sort of solution, a compromise, an agreement, which was win-win for both of them, and Webb was continued. But the cap was set at $8 billion and launched in 2018 with a very strong statement that it had to go forward, and it did. It was great. It was going forward very well for so many years. Here is the mirror. This is a Goddard Space Flight Center. I just loved going into this clean room and looking in and seeing the mirror sitting there with the instrument package behind. So the Sun Shield was being worked at that time separately at uh, Northrop Grumman. And so here is Webb being moved into a chamber down at Houston. The, this is the telescope and the instruments. And it was going to be cooled down to its operating temperature, 40 degrees above absolute zero, to actually check that everything worked. Three months in there, here it is sitting in this chamber, right through Hurricane Harvey. That, that's a story in its own right. Flooding, problems getting liquid nitrogen. It was a rough time for those guys. So, but it came out beautifully. It was performing great. So out at Northrop, they were building the Sun Shield and the spacecraft. And these are the Sun Shield layers, really flimsy plastic. So this is what we just deployed in space, layers and layers of this flimsy plastic. And here it is deployed in that chamber there, and you can see the five layers, and there is a huge amount of cabling and stuff. Here, a quarter of a mile of cables, hundreds of pulleys, motors, hinges, release mechanisms, and this all had to work in space. So this is why we were a little nervous at launch. We'd tested a lot of times, but we were still nervous. 
So then, of course, the telescope which came from Houston tested, and the sun shield and assembly at Northrop were then combined together. And so that was the point at which we had our full up telescope. And so Webb moved forward over the next few years. This is another story in its own right. It ran into problems again. And so we had trouble in 27, 2018, blew past the launch date, told Congress and OMB more money was needed. This was another rough period, but with you know, a lot of discussion about how to do it and review committees, there was general agreement we needed to move forward. And so doing that, the progress in the next few years was really good. Um, I think there was a much better teaming between NASA and Northrop, which really made a difference. And so it took a few years, but it was delivered within the new budget. And then it was ready in fall of 21, as I showed you, to head out to Kourou and to be launched. And so we're now at the point of seeing the fruits of all that activity. And that was last week. So there were big events at Space Telescope and at NASA Goddard down in Maryland, about 40, 50, 40 miles away. So Wendy and I were at the Space Telescope one, sitting in the auditorium, which was interesting because this is the very auditorium where we held the first meeting for NGST 33 years ago. So it sort of had a, it was a strange feeling being there and seeing this. The control room on the right there is actually at uh, um, Space Telescope Science Institute as well. And so let me walk through these images one at a time. So, this one I sh you saw back there, it's the deepest infrared image of the sky ever taken. It's about as deep as any Hubble image. And uh, you know, there's 500 hours on Hubble that we've set up, a field called the XDF, extreme deep field over the Hubble ultra deep field. This matches it in 12 hours. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And in this image, we know already there are image objects in here where we're looking back 13 billion years that are amplified and magnified behind this cluster. The white objects there are part of a cluster of galaxies and the galaxies there four billion years ago and the dark matter are amplifying all the galaxies behind. So we're using a cosmic telescope in front of it, our web telescope to actually see much further and much better. So that was our first ERO. The second one, and Oops, I have only a few minutes left. Okay, that'll probably work. So the second one was uh, the spectrum of an exoplanet. What NASA wanted to do here was demonstrate with EROs, was demonstrate the instruments, capability, and also the core science goals. And one of them was exoplanets, one of them was first galaxies. So here is a spectrum of an exoplanet. This is a remarkable, it's sort of hard to explain and realize how remarkable this is. A planet goes around the star, is occulted by the star and is uh, seen in front of the star. You take uh, spectra of, at various points in that cycle and you can subtract the star, which is incredibly bright compared to the planet, and see what the planet is showing. Showing water in this planet, it's not an everyday planet that you want to live on. It orbits the star every three and a half days, so it's very hot. But it was just remarkable that one orbit of this web could do this spectrum. So the exoplanet folks have seen this as a, out of this world because they're now realizing we're going to do a whole lot of planets and we're going to look for the signatures of life in the spectrum. The molecules, things like oxygen and so on, which or related ones, methane and so on, which you never would see if life wasn't there to continually replenish them. And so that's going to be a big deal science-wise for Hubble, uh, for Webb. The other one, the next one, of course, was the Southern Ring Nebula. Just a beautiful image of a dying star blasting its envelope out into space and uh, being... Uh, the, so the outer parts are sort of gas and dust out there. It happens to be two stars together. If you look in the right-hand image, so that's the shorter wavelength, longer wavelength. There's a red star in there. That's the one that's blowing out the material. And the blue star is a bright, hot companion, which has ionized the material inside. So you get this sort of blue area inside, which is hot, and then the cooler area outside. It's just a truly dramatic image. And it is actually fabulous to see the two stars. They hadn't been seen before like that. It took the far infrared image to really reveal those. 
So another, you know, just sort of wonderful example of something that's visually dramatic. Then there's Stefan's Quintet, which is uh, an image that was actually a, an object that was done with Hubble at one point, but with the cameras on web, it's just a whole new dimension of information. The galaxy on the left is actually much closer. It's a foreground galaxy. The four galaxies to the right are actually a group where they are moving past each other. And as I say, it's like a car wreck. Their gravitational force between them is destroying the outer parts of the galaxies, tearing stars and, and gas and dust out, and both making these long tidal tails, but also driving a lot of star formation as the gas bangs into itself. And so it's just a wonderful image visually, but also scientifically really interesting. And the background is just packed with distant galaxies too. So, and then of course there's this truly amazing image of the Carina Nebula. So a place where very young stars are forming, some have already formed and are so hot at driving, you see the streamers that are coming off, gas and dust, hot gas and dust that's being driven off by the really bright stars. In here are stars and planets, presumably. Most stars are likely to form with planets these days, as we sort of understand now. And so, really forming very young stars in there. So this one image contains a wealth of information beyond anything that we've had to look at star formation ever before. So the resolution, the depth, the wavelength coverage, just so unique. So, as I say here, these are dramatic and extraordinary images and they're visually striking, but ultimately we didn't just launch this to make pretty pictures. <laughs> we launched it to understand our universe. We launched it to understand our origins. That's what this is for me at least, and I think for a lot of folks. A telescope like this is exploring our origins in so many different ways, from the earliest galaxies through to star planets forming now and the planets themselves building up for life. So, what's the, where's the science in this? Well, it's only a week since these <laughs> images came out. So you've got to give us a little time, but actually we're working pretty hard on this. So these two papers came out on Tuesday, four or five days after the data was released. Here is an image taken with the near-infrared camera, which takes two fields on the sky at the same time. In each field, we found an extremely distant object. One of them is the same time back as a uh, distance as the one we would found with Hubble. So it's actually about three, 400 million years after the Big Bang. We're seeing the light from that time. So this is a galaxy that's obviously forming around that time. We're looking back through 13.4 billion years of time to see this. The other one is further away. It's a new record holder. And so at uh, it's 300 million years after the Big Bang, 13.5 billion years ago. So already, just in a few days, we've broken the record that we had before from Hubble. And so let me show you this one. So here it is, this most distant one. And so this is just the start. This image is deep by Hubble standards, comparably deep. But we're going to get dozens of these images and we're going to go deeper and we're going to see further further back in time. So we've started on this step of tracing back. The goal was first light, understanding how galaxies formed, when they for started forming, how they formed then, and how they built up over time to make galaxies like our Milky Way today. And so, as I said, I've started already. A dozen papers, I think, on the, the uh, servers and uh, new records are going to be broken all the time and so I'm sure you'll get to hear about it a lot. So here we are just to end. So it's a really a beginning of a new era, even more so than I expected. You know, I always was a hopeful, not hopeful, I felt that Webb was going to make a huge difference to astronomy, but I'm just blown away by how much of a difference and how powerful it is. And so we're on our way towards the first stars and galaxies, exoplanets, you name it, across the universe. Thank you very much. <laughs>Good, so we have some time for questions. Sure, so any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or try. I'm not a, you know, 
I'm not an exoplanet astronomer. I work on early galaxies, actually, but <laughs> I'm blown away by all these the different signs here. Sorry, yes? You said that um, you were talking about groups and the director said, you just know the next big thing now. The earlier the better. Mm -hmm. What would you say your thing you think the next thing we should start on? Your so this is interesting because we just had the 2020 decadal survey, and they recommended a big telescope, sort of comparable to Webb, now really set up to find and characterize planets around other stars. So to, to do a lot of what Webb is doing, no, it wouldn't be a cold telescope, it would be an optical telescope, more like Hubble, so it's like a super Hubble, uh, but really aimed at telling us about our neighbors, stars in our galaxies, the planets around them, and whether life really exists there or not. And so, that will probably take about 20 years to do from now. It's, it's something that we were working on before. You know, we'd already started talking about this 10. In fact, um, a couple of people and I organized a workshop in 2002 talking about the next big thing after web. So this, you know, it gets into the blood. And so that was really a big optical telescope. And so that's what the next big thing is. I hope. We have to convince OMB in Congress. <laughs> Sure. How does the Certainly. So that was absolutely important. So it turns out two of the instruments, so half the instrument complement of the four instruments actually are European instruments. The NERS spec, the incredibly powerful spectroscopic instrument, were, is, was entirely built in Europe. And the MIRI, the far infrared camera, uh, in camera, yes, and which does a little spectroscopy, was built mostly in Europe, but also with contributions from us here and the JPL, because we have the detector technology and they don't have that. So it was, that was more joint. And then the Canadians built an entirely separate one, which is an extremely powerful instrument too. So in fact, three of the four instruments are from our international collaborators. And of course, we wouldn't have got off the ground without Ariane. And so that was a, you know, an amazing launch. And they did a spectacular job for us. I, nobody could have done better. Did I answer all your question there? Good. Sorry, I think I missed some of that. There was a bit of noise outside. Ah, yeah, so the observations. So this is interesting. So astronomers, let me turn back. Astronomers every year can propose to use the telescope. And so we write all these detailed proposals and we get rejected. Because yeah. <laughs> only one in 10 gets accepted. So I'm used to being rejected much more than ever accepted. But, and then we use that pool of proposals to schedule the telescope over a year period, usually a little longer but we always have a little more just to make sure it, it's always operating efficiently. So it's basically every year, new proposals and then a new series of observations. And uh, interestingly, you know, the, much of, most of the data is public, but not all of it. And so much of it has a sort of kept aside for a year, which I think really should change. I mean, I think on something like this, open data sets are really important. So I think that will change with time. Uh, so, oh yeah, sorry. It's peer reviewed. So you write a proposal and it goes to a committee, big, probably a, over a hundred people or more involved. So there'll be panels which work in the particular science areas. They review it and say, okay, we like this one and we don't particularly like that. And then it goes to a final committee that does the final selection. But it's, yeah, it's competitive peer review. Yeah, very important point. I think here's a question down there. Oh, <laughs> distant galaxies. So I love that cluster. And I was on the, the paper that just worked and found this very interesting early object. And we're going to get some deeper data. And we're also going to get some wide data across the sky. And they will be both amazing data sets for looking at early galaxies. Yeah, I was one of the people who was the record holder on Hubble. The 400 million year after the Big Bang galaxy was one that we found in 2014, 2015. I think there was one there and then here. Did you have any 
Sorry, which? Um, I still didn't quite catch it. Has the tech kept improving over the decades? Did you have to redesign the telescope? Ah, again? so this is interesting because you know, the time scale for doing this is very long. So the instruments, for example, were finished in 2011. So they started being built in about 2004. So there's very little opportunity to follow the latest technology. And so that is a problem with space because there are just long time scales. Fortunately, they still are really contemporary in terms of their detectors and so on. But it's a good question. I mean, we'd love to be contemporary, but it's almost impossible, really because of the testing. You build it, you test it, and you test it again, you test it again. Then you put it together and you test the, the system the next level up. And so you end up going through subsystem after subsystem to the final thing. And the testing is crucial because otherwise it would never work. I think you had a question. So your earliest galaxy is 300 million years after the Big Bang. Yes. What's the earliest that you think you could detect with that? Ah, yeah, this is interesting, and it's already changing. We were thinking probably about 200 million years. If there are smaller galaxies before then, it would probably be very difficult. The one that we've found is really bright and has this puzzle, so it may actually mean that we may be able to find one of those a little earlier. But our expectation is that probably most of the stars and galaxies started forming around 150, 200, 250 million years, somewhere in there. If you look back further than that, you wouldn't see anything. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, there wouldn't be anything there. It's just gas. Gas and dark matter. Very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just there. So, in the end, uh, the American contribution for construction was $8.8 .8 $8 and. With the European and Canadian contributions, it's probably close to $10 billion. And then it costs about $175 million a year to operate. So this is not cheap, <laughs> to put it mildly. But uh, I have to tell you, I think it's good value. I mean, when we look at Hubble costs about the same, and you look at how Hubble has permeated the culture and people's fascination with what they see from Hubble, what we're learning about the our origins, about the universe, I think the same thing will be true of Webb. So I think it's a bargain for, you know, over, you know, over its lifetime. Yes? Um, probably very soon. So what uh, was planned was that every couple of weeks they might try to release something else. But I, I'm sure the scientists are working up the data, like the one I showed there as well, came from a new data that it was made available. So I would think you're likely to see photos every week or so, every couple of weeks that are new. Ah. Yes, and thank you all very much too. <laughs>